Thursday of the 19th week in Ordinary Time. A reading from the book of Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know I am with you, as I was with Moses. Now command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant to come to a halt in the Jordan when you reach the edge of the waters. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that there is a living God in your midst, who at your approach will dispossess the Canaanites. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of the whole earth will precede you into the Jordan. When the soles of the feet of the priests carrying the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of the whole earth, touch the water of the Jordan, it will cease to flow, for the water flowing down from upstream will halt in a solid bank. The people struck their tents to cross the Jordan, with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant ahead of them. No sooner had these priestly bearers of the Ark waded into the waters at the edge of the Jordan, which overflows all its banks during the entire season of the harvest, than the waters flowing from upstream halted, backing up in a solid mass for a very great distance indeed from Adam, a city in the direction of Zarephan, while those flowing downstream toward the salt sea of the Arabah disappeared entirely. Thus, the people crossed over opposite Jericho. While all Israel crossed over on dry ground, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord remained motionless on dry ground in the bed of the Jordan until the whole nation had completed the passage. The Word of the Lord. The Responsorial Psalm. The response is, Alleluia. When Israel came forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of alien tongue, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his domain. Alleluia. The sea beheld and fled, Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the hills like the lambs of the flock. Alleluia. Why is it, O sea, that you flee, O Jordan, that you turn back, you mountains that you skip like rams, you hills like the lambs of the flock? Alleluia. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Peter approached Jesus and asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him who owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of paying it back, his master ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, his children, and all his property in payment of the debt. At that, the servant fell down, did him homage and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back in full. Moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and forgave him the loan. When that servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a much smaller amount. He seized him and started to choke him, demanding, pay back what you owe. Falling to his knees, his fellow servant begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had the fellow servant put in prison until he paid back the debt. Now when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply disturbed and went to their master and reported the whole affair. 
His master summoned him and said to him, "You wicked servant, I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you?" Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly Father do to you, unless each of you forgives his brother from his heart. When Jesus finished these words, he left Galilee and went to the district of Judea across the Jordan. The Gospel of the Lord. Thursday of the nineteenth week in ordinary time. The first reading comes from Joshua three seven to eleven, and thirteen to seventeen. Yesterday we heard about how Moses died and was buried by God on Mount Nebo. Today we hear how the Israelite people begin to enter the Promised Land. Remember, Moses was not able to lead the people into the Promised Land because of a punishment he received for his lack of faith, especially expressed at the waters of Meribah. Now Joshua is being given this privilege. He's one of two people who left Egypt and is allowed to enter into the Promised Land. The other people of Israel died in the desert in the forty years that the people wandered that desert. He and Caleb, because of their fidelity, entered that Promised Land. And entering the Promised Land is almost a repetition of how the Israelites left Egypt. They had the priests bring the Ark of the Covenant to the edge of the Jordan River. And the Jordan River dries up, so that the people are able to pass through that river on dry land. That God is giving a powerful sign that He is fulfilling the promises He made to Moses and to the patriarchs that this would be the land of His people. The Gospel is from Matthew eighteen twenty-one to nineteen one. Peter asked Jesus, "How often must I forgive my brother?" Seven times. Remember, seven is the perfect number in the Bible. The ancients believed there were seven planets, so to say seven was already to say universality. It's almost like that eight, which is on its side, which means infinity in algebra. What is Jesus' response? Seventy-seven times. At seven times is not enough. The infinite is not enough. You have to forgive your brother beyond what you think is possible. And then Jesus tells a parable. About a servant who owed his master a great sum of money, couldn't pay it. The master forgave him, but then that same servant went out and had another fellow servant thrown in prison because that other fellow servant owed him a small amount of money that could not be repaid. The master who was owed the great sum becomes very angry and imprisons that servant who had been forgiven. We have been forgiven in a powerful way by the Lord. And we can look at ourselves, and we can say, "Well, I haven't really done anything all that bad. What do you mean the Lord forgave me in a great way?" And the response is that God has given us great gifts, and God expects us to respond to those gifts with generosity. If we have not responded to those gifts with the same generosity with which God gave us those gifts, then we will be held responsible. That God expects us to open our hearts and to be as loving as He is. At the end of this story, we hear that the man would be tortured until he pays all his debt. Now, some people have applied this to the idea of purgatory. They will not be released from the pain of purgatory until we've paid every bit for our sins, and that has two errors. First of all, purgatory is not a pain; it's a purification, a purification in which we learn to surrender to God's love. So, the fires of purgatory are not punishment; they're like the fires of a crucible. Which purifies our love, and then the second thing, Jesus has already paid the price for our sins. What purgatory is about is that we haven't allowed that forgiveness, that healing, to filter into our hearts. We're still holding on to our selfishness, our resentments, our jealousies, and until that is purified, we can't enter heaven. The problem with purgatory is not God. God's willing to invite us into heaven immediately. The problem is us. We're holding back. It's almost like being invited into a great palace room, 
and we're stuck in the doorway. We won't let go, because entering that palace room means surrendering our hearts to the nth degree, and we want to hold on to a little bit of ourselves. We're afraid to surrender it, lest we should die to ourselves. But remember, if we're not willing to die to ourselves, then we can't live. And may God bless us. Thank you.